emocionó. Fueron dos años muy, muy interesantes. Sí, sí. sí. No puedo imprimir. ¿No? No. We have a uh, one minute and a half. Maybe we can wait a little bit for people that is coming. Absolutely. We have an, until at this moment we have forty people. Right. Connected. Les voy a pedir a a todos por favor. Eh, que apaguen sus micrófonos para que tengamos una conexión bastante limpia y la grabación también sea. Sergio, good morning. Hey Sergio, how are you? Sergio from Colombia. José, José Murilo. ¿Cómo José? Parabéns. Parabéns. Aquele webinar foi de mundial, viu? Oh, graças. Muito bom. Obrigado. Foi uma ótima experiência. Jose, it was a great, it was a great accomplishment. It was wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Tony. Yeah, yeah fantastic. It was really great good, job. wasn't it? Oh, we got we got over two thousand people watching it. Yeah, it's amazing. From seven five different countries. Yeah, it was pretty good. How long did you work making it? Uh, about two months. Yeah, what's Month and a half to two months to put it together. Hola, Jose. You, you, ha you have a great support, right? Uh, just the four of us. You know, me, Bira, Thiago, and Marcus. And well, by the end, we got the deflux, got the money from deflux to pay deflux. for the. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, people, it's seven o'clock. Uh, bef uh, before uh, giving the introduction to Dr. Anthony Calamone, I would like to share with you. Uh, les voy a rogar, por favor, que apaguemos todos nuestros micrófonos. Yo los había puesto para que entren apagados, pero hay gente que tiene su micrófono activado. Así que les ruego, por favor, encarecidamente que podamos este, apagar nuestro micrófono. Antes de darle la bienvenida al doctor Caldamone, quiero avisarles que hoy tenemos su presentación como testículo no descendido, un update. La próxima semana estará el doctor profesor Pedro José López de Chile con historia de una revolución, revolución, reflujo vesicolateral, lución. Este, estamos expectantes sobre este contenido. Gracias, PJ. Y para los que eventualmente quieran ver las charlas que ya se difundieron, por favor visítenos en Germán Quevedo P. Y eh, pueden ver los videos que están siendo oh, colgados en, en la red. Todos lo conocemos al profesor Anthony Caldamone, que es un great speaker en... I will, I will uh, try to speak in English because these words are for him. And 
everybody knows that he is the chief editor of the pediatric urology journal. He is the one of the greatest speakers in the world. Bom dia, Maria. Esta reunião é em inglês, português e em castellano. O sea, una combinación arrecha. Sí, sí. Por lo menos entiendo algunas cosas. Pero está interesante. No me ha empezado todavía. Um, I think German went offline for a minute. He must be having a computer problem. Well, sorry, German, you're back. Okay, I see now. Yeah, okay, Thank good. You. So, I am so sorry. Yeah. But, uh, he mandado ahí un esto para que vaya a las manos que hayan de correr. Te siento aquí. Te siento aquí. Cuatro kits. Cuatro kits. Los medicamentos. Te he mandado la invitación. Apaga el cuatro kits. Ahí hay cuatro. Tres mil. Tres mil. Ancho. Apaga tu, apaga tu micrófono, por favor. Ok. I will give to Dr. Caldemont. Ok. But, uh, ok. Did you see my screen, Tony? I did see your screen. I saw you the picture when you were in Providence. That's right. I did okay. recognize that. Okay. Yeah. Can I can I follow? Follow? Okay. So uh, I will tell you, everybody, that Dr. Anthony Caldomene, as you know, one of the best speakers in the world in pediatric urology. But you don't know who is Tony. Tony Caldomene is the best person I, I, I met in this meeting in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. He is Dr. Anthony Caldamone. He's his brother and best friend, maybe, Dr. David Diamond, and John Brack. It was an amazing meeting we have here. But let me tell you, when I been in Dr. Caldamone's house, he made me do a trip for hour, one hour and 19 minutes to see one amazing place. He told me that we was going to cover his uh, plant. It's, I don't know the, 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 the name in English. is the eagle, fig, I think it's fig. Fig, and, fig tree, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I don't believe him because maybe he was so kind with me and he was trying to bring me to, to know that beautiful place. Anyway, thank you, Tony. Uh -huh. But let me tell you, as you know, I come my seven years in Brazil. I think that I, I learned to do caipirinha. And he's fan of caipirinha. We was, I was teaching, he was learning. I hope he's learned. But I, let me tell you, he's a great cooker. Dr. Calamon is a great cooker. He made a beautiful and a delicious fish. Thank you, Tony. It was very delicious. I don't know why he's uh, the people, the young people likes very much him. And he every month has a meeting 
that he called quiz time. And they expect for learning, but they expect for the pizza also. And my daughter, he got with him two or three times and she called him Uncle Tommy. And how he does it, I don't know. He's Tommy, man. He's a great sportman. He likes bicycle, he likes mountain climber. He's a good mountain climber. And this was a beautiful game that we went to see the Boston College against the uh, College of the City. In the dramatic final, the City State team won and, told me, and to Tony told me as always. But let me tell you something. Tony, he is, he's with the Bolivian national team uh, Camiseta, I don't know in English, he's Dr. Brock, and he does many, many trips to Bolivia three times to teach, to share his knowledge, and to do the better thing he, he knows to do that, to be the good for people. For that, thanks for being Tony. Thank you, Tony. The people is waiting for you, and they, uh, and I will give you the command of the okay okay so i'll go ahead and uh, and share my screen german thank you very much for the could you uh allow me... oh here we go okay mm -hmm. all right and we'll do that thank you very much for the most gracious introduction and uh, a view down memory lane to uh to um reminisce about some wonderful times together, both in Bolivia, as well as back up in Rhode Island. Um, I do want to uh, give my compliments to the team at the Japanese hospital and to German in particular, for putting together this lecture series, which um, um, has taken advantage of a very difficult situation across the world, as you know, but uh, allowed for a good outcome. And that, in that regard, I will uh, share with you a quote that I wish I knew who said this, but I don't. Uh, but it is a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And I think uh, the fact that the lecture series has grown out of this crisis that we're dealing with shows that one is taking advantage of a difficult situation. I also want to take the opportunity and the liberty to dedicate this lecture to one of my mentors and close friends, Howard Snyder. Howard passed away recently. Howard was my attending along with John Duckett at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia when I trained. And he remained a mentor to me for my whole career. He opened many doors for me and um, I, I owe him a debt of gratitude. He passed away about a week and a half ago. He was a consummate surgeon, he was an academician. He was a historian and got me interested in medical history. He was a true ambassador for pediatric urology, mentor, and a very, very close friend. And I'll miss him dearly. So greetings from Providence, Rhode Island, where we are, I am sitting, Brown University. This is the front campus of Brown University. The significance and why I show this picture is because of this particular building, which is called Manning Chapel. And that's the uh, chapel that my wife and I were married. It's also the chapel that my daughter was married uh, not too long ago. And then finally, Hasbro Children's Hospital, uh, which is the hospital name for the toy company, Hasbro Toy Company, one of the few hospitals in the world named for a toy company. It opened in 1994. So I do have some wonderful memories of my time in Bolivia. I have wonderful memories of the friends, the hospitality, um, the camaraderie, the education, the operating side by side, the conferences, they were beautiful trips to Bolivia. And I hope that someday in the future we'll be able to resume them again because I have very, very fond memories of my time there and the wonderful people. So I'm gonna start off a little bit of history in Howard's honor. And this is John Hunter. So John Hunter was probably the father of modern surgery. But what most people don't know is that he was one of the first to describe the processus vaginalis, 
cryptorchidism and why we need to treat the undescended testis. John's history and how he got into medicine is a little bit circuitous because he was destined to become a minister. His father wanted him to be a minister similar to what his father was, but he took advantage of an opportunity in order to turn the tables around on this. His brother William was a gynecologist and his brother William practiced down in London. John and his family were from Scotland. And in, the, in his practice, he opened up an anatomy lab. And John decided that he was gonna go work with his brother William uh, in his anatomy lab in Covent Garden in London. And so one of the first jobs that John Hunter had was he was a grave robber. They needed fresh cadavers on a regular basis for the anatomy and the anatomical dissections that they were doing for the anatomy lab. And so he and a group of others would go into the graveyards at night and steal bodies in order to steal bodies in order to have fresh bodies every few days. There was no formaldehyde at the time. So there needed to be a rapid turnover of bodies in order to continue the anatomy lab going. And these are some wonderful images of Covent Garden and some painting of the dissecting room of William, um, uh, William Hunter's anatomy dissecting room in Covent Garden. This painting is by Thomas uh, Rawlinson. So that's how John Hunter got started as an anatomist and eventually as a modern day surgeon. But in one of the most popular and one of the most famous publications in all of medicine, he said this, when one or both testicles remain throughout life in the belly, I believe that they are exceedingly imperfect and probably incapable of performing their natural functions. And that this imperfection prevents a disposition for descent from taking place. So here he described the abnormality of an undescended testis. He described that they do not function well when they are undescended and that there's something about them being undescended that prevents them from becoming descended. This is all depicted very, very well in this book, which I would recommend to everyone called The Knife Man. It's written by Wendy Moore and, 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 and goes through the extraordinary life and time of John Hunter, who again, we consider the father of modern surgery. I'd recommend this for everyone for a good summer reading. So my objectives in this talk, I'm gonna focus on a few things. The non-palpable testis, discussing a bit about cancer risk, touching on microlithiasis, our theories regarding the undescended testis and fertility, and then finally, a couple of tricks of the trade. So David and I, I think David will be speaking to you in a few weeks on DSD. David and I wrote a paper almost 30 years ago. It was one of the first papers that advocated for laparoscopy for the impalpable testis, because our justification for this was that in our series of a little over 100 impalpable testes, we find that nearly 50% of the time, we're able to make the diagnosis laparoscopically. Because about a third of the time, roughly, there were blind ending vessels and vas, and 16% of the time, there was a testis that was located in the abdomen, and we could proceed with correction at that time. In this case, you can see a first stage Fowler Stevens orchidopexy with a clipping there. But what happens when you do see vas and vessels going through a ring? Uh, laparoscopically, what should be your tape? What should you do with this situation? Well, this, as you can see, is an open internal ring with very robust vessels and vas going into it. This is pretty straightforward because the likelihood is that you're gonna find a testicle in the inguinal canal or beyond uh, with the wide open ring. And what has happened in this scenario is that there was an abdominal testis most likely that's been going back and forth. And with the increase in intra-abdominal pressure from the CO2 insufflation, it has forced the testis to go into the ring and into the canal. But what about these scenarios where you have vas and vessels going into a closed ring? Does this warrant exp expiration? And if so, what is the justification for that? Well, we looked into this a number of years ago with a study that we combined with Bob Weiss at, at Yale. In, of the over 800 laparoscopies that had done between the two institutions for the non-palpable testis, 110 had a closed internal ring with vessels and vas entering the ring. And we found that in 93% of the time when an inguinal expiration was done, there were no germ cells found in that residual atrophic 
gonad, what we sometimes refer to as a nubbin, as you know. But 7% of the time, there were germ cells present. As a result, we strongly recommended that when you find this scenario laparoscopically, you should proceed with an inguinal expiration because isn't it possible that these cells could go on to form cancer? Well, is that really true now? I think data has come up more recently that may refute that conclusion because we have to remember that the reason that these are scrotal remnants or these are nubbins is not because of a maldescent problem necessarily, but a problem of in utero torsion, of course. And if one looks at the risk of cancer, and this is, a, I think, one of the classic articles uh, that re-looked at cryptorchidism and testicular cancer by Hadley Wood, then at that time and still at the Cleveland Clinic and Jack Elder when he was at Case Western Reserve. They showed that there's really only been one reported case of intertesticular germ cell neoplasm or carcinoma in situ in a nubbin. So the risk probably is extremely low for the nubbin or the residual germ cells within a nubbin to go on and form uh, cancer. The conventional teaching, of course, would tell you otherwise. The conventional teaching had been that there's a 40 times increased risk of malignancy in an undescended testis, and that 10% of all testicular tumors arise in an undescended testis. But we have to remember that this is based on confounding data. These were large groups of patients with many other abnormalities, in some cases abnormal karyotype and abnormal genitalia as well both of which may be risk factors that increase the malignancy rate. So I think this teaching is old, and I think we have to take into account the more recent data that has come up to indicate that the risk of malignancy is probably a bit lower than this. What's the pathophysiology behind the malignancy risk? Well, we know, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes, that an undescended testis has a lack of progression of gonocytes to AD spermatogonia. AD referring to adult dark spermatogonia. And it's thought that the persistence of the gonadocytes and the failure to progress to AD spermatogonia is results in the precursor to carcinoma in situ or intertesticular germ cell neoplasm. We also quite clear that the timing of the orchidopexy does have an influence in terms of the risk of malignancy. Two excellent studies taught us that if you perform an orchidopexy under puberty years, you have a lower relative risk of developing cancer. Whereas pubertal or post-pubertal years, the relative risk of developing malignancy as a result of that undescended testis is much, much higher. So an earlier orchidopexy, that is prior to puberty, does reduce the risk of cancer. Whether there's a difference between an orchidopexy done prior to puberty at nine years of age versus an orchidopexy done at six months of age in terms of that malignancy risk, we do not have data that tells us for certain that there's a difference between those two populations. We can only say that pre-pubertal does make a difference. There are also some other risk factors uh, associated with an undescended testis that probably increase the risk of cancer as well. And that is an undescended testis associated with chromosomal defects, other general uh, anomalies, and as mentioned, an undescended testis in a post pubertal boy. But what about the question of, and by the way, in this, these particular populations, I would generally recommend the biopsy be done. What about testicular microlithiasis? Is, it high, is there a higher risk of this in cryptorchid boys? Does it increase the risk of malignancy and what should our follow-up strategy be in this particular scenario? Well, Doug Hoosman published an excellent paper looking at the increased malignancy risk for microlithiasis. And it's not across the board in generic, but seems to be associated with certain populations, such as there's a 20% increased risk of CIS in subfertile men with bilateral microlithiasis or if you have a unilateral germ cell tumor and there's contralateral microlithiasis, that does place that testis at a higher risk for malignancy. But we know that microlithiasis is so, so common that we need to risk stratified into these groups to be certain as to which patients we should be following more closely. 
And regarding cryptorchidism in microlithiasis, there is a 10% incidence of microlithiasis in cryptorchidism, which is at least, I think, even higher than a twofold greater risk. And 10% of these will go on to develop malignancy. Again, a two to three fold increased risk. So clearly, when you have an undescended testis associated with microlithiasis, one has to be on the uh, concern, long-term concern, that that child is carrying a much higher risk of malignancy beyond that of just cryptorchidism alone and beyond that of just microlithiasis alone. So what do we do with this patient? So here's a patient who had a non-palpable testis on the left side, as you can see. And here we did a first stage follower Stevens. We successfully were able to put that testis down into the scrotum in a second stage. I generally had obtained ultrasounds about six months postoperatively to, to document a baseline size of the testis and flow to the testis. And here he is, he has microlithiasis. What should the follow-up be for this child? Do we get markers for this patient? Do we follow this child with serial ultrasounds? Uh, he's not at an age where he's going to be formed testicular examination. I'm sorry, testicular self-examination, however. Well, I think it's quite clear to remember that prepubertal orchidopexy does reduce the risk of malignancy, but it does not eliminate the risk of malignancy. So I think it's incumbent on us in this situation, in this particular scenario of an undescended testis with microlithiasis, that we follow that patient at least until that patient is able to perform adequate self-examinations at the time of puberty. That would be my teaching about this particular scenario. Now, regarding fertility, there's a wise old saying that goes something like this. If your grandfather and your father were infertile, then you're probably gonna be infertile as well. I don't know if this translate, translates appropriately and gets the point across, but I hope it does. There are a couple of different ways that one can associate fertility with an undescended testis. One is ductal abnormalities. Uh, depending on the position of the testis, the patency of the processus vaginalis, about 30 to 70% of undescended testis can have an abnormality of the ductal system, either a very loosely attached epididymis, something Howard Snyder used to call the digital epididymis because you can get your finger between the epididymis and the testis, or even blind ending vas deferens. But most of the fertility issues related to undescended testis are due to an intrinsic developmental abnormality in that biopsies of undescended testes compared to normal testes show an increased number of gonocytes, reduced AD spermatogonia. Here in the normal testis, you can see normal adult dark spermatogonia and a reduction in primary gonocytes as well. I'm sorry, I apologize. A reduction in primary spermatocytes as you can see here in the normal situation. Now, how does that all occur? Well, we think it's probably due to a surge of LH that occurs around the time of birth, in that the LH surge causes, a, causes some health in postnatal testicular descent, but also sets up the first step in germ cell development. It sets up a mini puberty, if you will, and this happens around two to three months of age. So in the fetal germ cell pool, what we have is a high number of gonocytes, high number of gonadocytes, I'm sorry, gonadocytes, uh, gonocytes, and a lack of AD spermatogonia. And as a result of the surge of LIH and then the result in surge in testosterone at roughly two months um, postnatal uh, is when the testosterone surge kicks in four to six weeks or so, there's an apoptosis of some of these primordial cells and a conversion to AD spermatogonia so that the normal uh, testis will have a lower count of gonadocytes and gonocytes and have presence of AD spermatogonia. In classic work done uh, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Howard Schneider is on this uh, work as one of the co-authors as well, they took a large number of patients with unilateral undescended testis, performed orchidopexy, but did bilateral testicular biopsies on them and compared the undescended testis to the contralateral descended testis, first in the less than one year old age group at the time of surgery, and showed that the total fetal germ cell count was increased, gonal sites were increased, and AD spermatogonia were, were significantly reduced 
and the undescended testis versus the contralateral descended testis. In the older age population who had orchid pectus of two to nine years of age, there was a significant lack of, of spermatogonia in the undescended testis, and also a modest lack of spermatogonia in the contralaterally descended testis. And this was what we think accounts for the fertility uh, compromise that boys have with undescended testes. So what's happening in, in this scenario is that that LH surge is probably blunted, or at least the response to the LH surge and the increase in testosterone is blunted, such that we don't have that conversion from the fetal germ cell, from the fetal stem cell pool to the adult stem cell pool, and the lack of development of AD spermatogonia, which results in the malignancy. So the blunted response to LH results in a decrease in AD spermatogonia, which leads to infertility, but also results in a persistence of gonadocytes, which may be the risk factor associated with uh, cancer developing in the undescended testes. So the question then comes up, does orchidopexy make a difference? So these are not multiple studies from Peter Lee uh, in, in Hershey, uh, Pennsylvania at the time uh, and others in which they went by questionnaire semen analysis and some paternity data. And this is mostly paternity data that you see here in that a corrected undescended testis, fertility or paternity rates were about 65%, whereas that in a unilateral undescended testis, fertility rates were about 90%. And 83% of those in the unilateral group had normal sperm density, morphology, and motility as well compared to 93%. So a modest reduction, if you will, uh, in uh, fertility in the unilaterally undescended group. And the orchidopexy probably affords a modest improvement, therefore, in fertility potential. Hazlamovic in his work, so Hazlamovic uh, Farouk uh, is from uh, Basel, Switzerland, came over to work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in the early 90s and working with Howard Snyder and John Duckett, um, and, and, and Dale Huff from the previous study uh, provides a lot of this data that uh, is so relevant today to us. And in, this, in his independent studies from Basel, uh, Switzerland, however, he took a large number of crook orchid men who had biopsies during childhood and then was able to get semen analysis on roughly about 19, at 19 years of age and showed that an orchidopexy done at less than three years of age, there was a threefold higher sperm count. And the younger the unilateral undescended testis at orchidopexy, the higher the sperm count. And when he looked at the uh, histology in this particular population, he found that those who had a unilateral undescended testis, and at the time of orchidopexy, had the presence of AD spermatogonia, had a sevenfold higher sperm count. However, if there was no AD spermatogonia, the timing of orchidopexy did not seem to influence the rate of fertility. And in the bilateral situation, it was even more dramatic in that if on biopsy at the time of orchidopexy, there were AD spermatogonia present, there was a significant, a very significant increase in the sperm cell count in that population. And therefore the likelihood of fertility is dramatically improved. So the question comes up in this blunted response that happens in cryptorchid testis with the LH surge and the resultant testosterone and the lack of progression that we should see can this be influenced in some way? Can hormonal therapy, in addition to orchidopexy, influence the progression from, fetal stem pool, uh, from the fetal stem cell pool to the normal adult stem cell pool? Well, this has been looked at in a number of studies and all have shown similar results, most all have shown similar results. In this particular group of 42, uh, boys who were biopsied at the time of or orchidopexy, those who had neoadjuvant GnRH therapy showed that there was a significant increase in AD spermatogonia per tubule and AD spermatogonia per tubule at less than 24 months as well, but the younger ones was even more so, giving us some indication that it's possible that neoadjuvant hormonal therapy may be helpful. And similarly, getting back to um, Farouk Hablamovich's work, he also showed that post orchidopexy GnRH at six months of age, orchidopexy followed by GnRH, and then looking at semen parameters at a mean age of 19 years, 
showed a dramatic improvement in sperm count for ejaculate and the percent of normal sperm in those in, uh, who had an orchidopexy plus GnRH. So promising results at this point. However, they've not been reproducible results. And I think primarily, the, and that is the primary reason as why this has not been universally adopted. So one asked the question, is there a risk in adjuvant hormonal therapy at that age? Well, three studies suggest that there are purely deleterious effects of adjuvant hormonal therapy. Cortez, which looked at orchidopexy with, with or without HCG or GnRH, found that surgery alone without hormonal therapy seemed to have the best results. This is a very small series, but significant in the less. Burr and Lachlan looked at it even longer time ago and show that HCG failure uh, to uh, fail to lower, I'm sorry, uh, in those who had HCG, there was a lower somatogonia per tubule ratio. And then finally, the uh, study from 2007 showed a minimal positive effect from the use of hormonal therapy in a meta-analysis that was done. So raising some questions as to whether there might indeed be some risk associated with the use of hormonal therapy in children who have undescended testes. Well, a very famous statesman, Dan Quayle, former US Vice President, once, Vice President once said, predictions are risky, especially when they are about the future. Once again, I hope that translates okay. But I would predict going to the future that we're probably gonna risk stratify children with undescended testes. Age dependency is a factor, as we already know. But maybe we should be considering biopsy at the group that we would identify as having a high risk of fertility problems and identify those who have absence of spermatogonia or reduced spermatocytes per tubule and consider this population for adjuvant hormonal therapy at the time of orchidopexy because of the higher risk benefit ratio and that being in the bilateral undescended testes primarily. Okay, let's take a little breather for just a second. And I wanna talk a little bit about a couple of tricks of the trade that I use in orchidopexy, two in particular. So this is the first one. I of course learned orchidopexy the way everyone else has learned orchidopexy, I think, from Howard Snyder primarily and through a standard inguinal incision, isolating the uh, testis and spermatic cord, and an open dissection of the processus vaginalis off the spermatic cord, which provides the majority of the length in um, moving the testis down into the scrotum, followed by the use of a dartos pouch. However, I became enamored uh, when I talked with Adrian Bianchi at one time, about the use of the pre-scrotal orchidopexia, what he termed the transcrotal orchidopexia. And there have been a number of studies that have looked at this as well, uh, from Adrian when he moved to Manchester, England, Marty Coyle's group uh, from Denver as well. So the pre-scrotal orchidopexia, I say, is designed for those palpable descended testes, particularly those that are located in the superficial inguinal pouch of Dennis Brown, where an incision is made um, along the line between the scrotum and the perineum. And here one can see that incision with the use of retractors, one can easily get up into the inguinal canal uh, from this approach. And then one, and dealing with the process of vaginalis at that time, and then creating a pouch between the dartos muscle of the scrotum and the scrotal wall in order to tuck the testis in place. We reported our series on 85 pre-scrotal orchidopexies uh, back in 2003, I believe. Um, and our follow-up was quite good. We had one that we had to resort to an inguinal incision because I felt that I couldn't, did not adequately ligate the processus vaginalis. No testis went on to atrophy. One retracted back up into the groin and, rely, and required a repeat operation. And there were no post-op hernias that were identified in this population followed uh, for two years afterwards. So I think that is a good technique to consider. It's a single incision, um, a little bit of local anesthesia, and they're on their way. Second trick of the trade. 
Second trick of the trade is dealing with the processor's vaginalis. The standard teaching uh, that I learned on uh, was to open the processor's vaginalis and isolate the processor's vaginalis from the spermatic cord, as you see in these images, sometimes referred to as the mouse under the blanket technique. I always wondered why I struggled with this particular step at times, and it wasn't quite as easy as doing a, a communicating hydrosteel or even a hernia, a uncomplicated hernia for that matter. But this step I always found difficult. Why? I realized is that there's an anatomical difference between the processus vaginalis TV of the communicating hydrosteel and the processus vaginalis of an undescended testis. The processus vaginalis of a communicating hydrosteel, as described in any surgical text, will tell you that it's anterior medially located in relationship to the spermatic cord, the vas deferens, and the vas and vessels. Whereas that of the processus vaginalis of the undescended testis is quite different. It tends to be more exuberant and almost go all the way around the spermatic vessels, only having this little opening here. So that trying to get into this plane can be quite difficult. Now, I hope these videos work and I'll show you the schematically what we're doing with an anterior approach. That is the classic approach that, that I learned on. Make an incision. You open up the edges and then you get into the plane this way. But this can come down quite a bit further and I've always found this dissection to be a little bit tricky and in particular kind of hard to teach. So we've taken a different approach and that is a posterior approach. Now here's the testicle, I'm sorry, here's the somatic cord flipped around 180 degrees. So the processus vaginalis is posterior vas and vessels. And what we're going to do is we're going to make an incision in the external spermatic fascia, ESF, external spermatic fascia, ISF, internal spermatic fascia, and see what happens when we make that incision. What happens is, is that the spermatic cord comes right up at you, and your dissection plane is very, very easy to, in the internal spermatic fascia to dissect the spermatic cord from the, uh, from the processus vaginalis. I think it's a much, much easier dissection to make. And here are a couple of illustrations. So again, this is with the spermatic cord flipped 180 degrees, so we're looking at it posteriorly. We've made an incision in the external spermatic fascia. We come right down on the vessels and right down on the vas. And so behind the vessels and vas would be the external spermatic fascia and the processus vaginalis, which you can just very bluntly peel off the processus vaginalis is here, the spermatic cord is there in order to get that separation. I think it's a much easier technique to use for the dissecting the processus vaginalis off the spermatic cord in the undescended testis, and a very much easier technique to teach and for residents and trainees to grasp. In our series that we've uh, reported, we showed that in this non-inferiority study, if you will, that they were pretty much equal as to whether you went through a posterior approach or an anterior approach with very little problem as far as complications were concerned and quite comparable to the anterior approach. Finally, I'm gonna close with another piece of history. And that is this gentleman. This is John Kingsley Latimer, the chief of urology at Columbia. He was a leader nationally and internationally in urology. Interestingly, he was an outstanding Olympic caliber athlete, a runner, and he was a key figure in establishing the field of pediatric urology in the United States, as he was instrumental in starting the Society for Pediatric Urology, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics section of urology. The reason I bring him up is because he started a pediatric urology unit at one of the first children's hospitals in the United States. Babies Hospital in New York City, again, part of the University of Columbia. And what he said, I undertook this, that is the development of pediatric urology, dwelling on cryptorchidism and extrophy, which were surprisingly common in the Babies Hospital. His contribution to the orchidopexy per se is something that we do every day in the operating room, and that is the scrotal pouch technique. He described developing a scrotal pouch between the scrotal wall 
and the dartos in order to use that as the anchor. And he said some cases of orchidopexy fail because the testis is permitted to lie inside the muscular dartos. And he described having to pull that testis through the dartos and using that dartos in premisteric fascia in order to anchor the testis himself by making a separate transverse incision in the skin of the scrotum to uh, undermine a pocket between the skin and the dartos. Uh, the follow-up to that technique, you'd be interested to know, is that he used to connect the testis to a rubber band. He had a stitch coming out of the testis, had a rubber band, and the rubber band would be anchored to just above the knee of the patient. And that anchor, rubber band anchor, would stay in place for 10 days, the patient lying in bed in the hospital. And at that point, they would cut the rubber band, take the brace off, and have the patient go home. But that wasn't all, that wasn't all. To be absolutely certain, he said this, it is important that the mother or the father be carefully instructed to pull downwards on the operated testis for 10 long and forceful pulls each morning and night. He said it's recognized that there is some psychologic hazard in advising this maneuver, but this, he said, is a calculated risk. So with that, I'll finish with one of my famous quotes from another philosopher, Woody Allen. And Woody Allen once said, eternity is a long time, especially near the end. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. I feel honored to be able to contribute. I hope you found this useful. And uh, I look forward to the day when I'll again be able to uh, visit uh, Bolivia and say hello to all my friends again. Thank you very much. Okay, there we go. So I think we now we should have some time for uh, questions and answers. I hope uh, Roberto is in the audience to uh, help us out with any uh, translation as well. So let's, uh, let's open it up for questions and answers. Oh, maybe questions, I'm not sure I have any answers. We'll have questions anyway. I think you're muted, uh, German, I think you're muted. Okay, my audio is okay. Okay? Yeah. Could, could you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Tony, for your kind presentation and wonderful presentation. Uh, <clears throat> we are so proud to be with you. Uh, any question, please? Tony. Well, I see a question from Jose. Okay. Jose Marulo Jose, has a question. Uh, okay. What's your opinion on fertility and retractive testes? That's an interesting question. I can't answer that for sure. Uh, and I think um, uh, Yang Wu is on this call as well because he was involved at CHOP when they did do a study looking at the retractile testis that became secondarily undescended. So here you had a boy that was examined, had a retractile testis, and then some years later presents as an undescended testis. And in that particular population, in that particular population of patients, where they biopsied at the top at the time, they biopsied the undescended testis, that the retractile testis that became undescended, the retractile testis looked more like a standard undescended testis than a regular uh, testis as well, than a normal testis. So I don't know the answer to say that I think there may be uh, some fertility risk in boys who have a retractile testis that eventually becomes a secondarily undescended testis. Yang, could you um, make, a, make a comment about that as well? Because I know you were around CHOP at the time when some of that data was coming out. Sure. Um, I, I think it's still difficult to know which of the boys um, is going to have an ascended testis. So, um, I mean, generally, we, we, we didn't operate on retractile testes at that point, but we would follow the ones that were difficult. Um, and that's where that data came from, the ones that eventually ascended. Correct. So I think one would have to conclude that those retractile testes that eventually become secondarily undescended, or as Yang called it, ascended, uh, probably have the same fertility risk as a primarily undescended testis, at least based on that data. But there's not a lot of other data out there regarding retractile testes, unfortunately. Okay, Tony, we have another from Amadeo 
from Paraguay. Uh, what would you recommend in two years old boy with the intra-abdominal test, left test, that is the half of size of the normal right test, which is your recommendation? First of all, I wanna say hello to Amadeo. He became one of my very, very close friends last uh, fall when we got to spend some time together uh, in Patagonia. It's good to see you on the video and thank you for the question. Um, so my recommendation is that if the test is structurally looks normal otherwise, <clears throat> even if it's small, I would put it down. Uh, I think putting it down at an early age does the best we can as far as reducing cancer risk. Whether it truly will have any effect as far as fertility in the future, I doubt it. I would only remove it if it was technically impossible to put it down, which is rare in a two-year-old, but possible, or it looked structurally abnormal, did not look like a normal test, in which I'd either biopsy and put it down, or I would not put it down at all. But otherwise, if it structurally looks, and this is very, very gross morphological examination, of course, the structure looks okay, I would definitely put it down in the scrotum. From Carlos Delgado. Uh, which uh, edge do you recommend to resolve surgically uh, this patient with antiseptic testicles? I'm sorry, could you run that question by me again? I missed which it. Is, which is your better edge for resolve and descending testicles? Which is my better the recommended, age? The recommended edge. Oh, age, got it. Okay, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think you've got to get beyond that LH surge, but realistically, I think any time after about three months of age, you can do it. But once again, there's no data to support that doing it at six months of age versus doing it at two years of age makes a difference. We have no data that says that. And that has come up more recently when we got into the anesthesia question about Elective, elective surgeries and anesthesia in young children. So I think it's reasonable to say that somewhere between six and 18 months of age is an ideal time to do an undescended testis. Uh, beyond uh, younger than that, I don't think you can force the issue. So I would say somewhere between six and 18 months of age is reasonable. Okay, uh, Tony, could you put your camera? Please, we are seeing the half of your head. You're okay. seeing the ce uh, but you're seeing the ceiling in the... Okay, Gabi Jimenez. Yeah, Gabi Jimenez say, uh, let me, I, I lose here. Uh, Gabi, Gabi Jimenez, what are your thoughts on primary laparoscopic or orchidopexy versus Stephen Fowler? Yeah, excellent. Um, so, last time I was down, I saw Pipo on the screen a little while ago. I don't know where he is, but last time I was down at Pipo's institution, Pipo and PJ uh, showed me their laparoscopic assisted orchidopexy. And I think that they are probably doing primary um, laparoscopic orchidopexy versus Fowler Stevens. I think if you're technically able to do that with a low risk to the testis and a high success rate, I think it makes sense to do it in one step as opposed to two steps. We know that um, from data on a two-stage laparoscopic orchidopexy, that it takes a good couple of months for there to be a buildup of, um, of uh, revascularization of that testis. So that testis does undergo a vascular hit when you do a two-stage orchidopexy. And we don't have data to tell us whether that vascular hit is significant enough to cause problems as far as function later on. So I would say that if you're technically able to do it in one stage, it's better than doing it in two stage. But that's just my empiric impression without any data to support it. And I was very impressed with both uh, PJ and Pipo uh, in their uh, technical abilities to do that laparoscopically as a lap-assisted single stage orchidopexy for the abdominal testis. I still have the videos from that. Thank you, Tony. Uh, another question is, uh, what do, uh, what age do you recommend? Uh, what is your opinion about shihata technique? I don't know that technique. I saw that question come up, so someone's going to have to educate me on that. Yeah, the, maybe this is the the technique that he 
push the testicle inside the abdomen to the other side. I think this is the technique that Amadeo is asking. Do you hear about it? Um, I think um, I'm not I'm just not not that familiar with. And Amadeo, tell us a little bit more about it, please. Can I? Okay. Uh, can I? <clears throat> can I? Uh, German? Yes. Okay. Oh. Uh, thank you, and uh, nice to see you again, uh, uh, Tony. And thank you very much. I really feel the same the same thing. In, in uh, we had a great time in Patagonia. Uh, the technique is uh, removing, um, moving this the testes from its place laparoscopically, and pull it to the other side uh, to to the uh, to the right. alcohol, okay. yeah. uh, internal ring. And fix it there for three months. So in that, in and uh, they showed that the uh, the vessels and the bars uh, get longer with the time. And then you do a second stage to uh, pull it, to pull the the testes to the uh, to the scrotum. Yeah, I think now I remember you telling me about this in Patagonia, actually. Um, so all I can say about that without any experience whatsoever is that way back in the 90s when we were first starting to do laparoscopy and deciding whether uh, for an abdominal testis we should do a one-stage versus a two-stage procedure, Craig Peters taught me that if you pick up the undescended testis and you pull it over to the contralateral internal ring, if you're able to pull it over to that ring, you probably have enough mobility in that testis to be able to put it down into the scrotum as a single stage procedure and not a two stage procedure. Um, so I can't say much about the technique itself since I haven't done it, but I wonder based on what I learned from Craig Peters many, many years ago, that if in that particular scenario, when you're able to pull it over all the way to the opposite internal ring anyway, whether you might have enough length to put it down primarily. Just a thought. Uh, Alejandro Peñarrieta from YouTube asked uh, if in the approach, in the posterior approach to the incision of the fa fascia, the spermatic fascia, uh, you do close to the external or the internal, or uh, external or the close to the testicle, where do you do, you do the It doesn't approach? matter, it doesn't matter that much. I think I try and stay away from the testicle only because you can get into the convoluted vas deferens and that makes it a little, little bit trickier. But the standard place that you would normally do an anterior approach is where I would do a posterior approach. And I would really, really encourage you to try it because I think you've, once you've done it this way, you'll find that it's a lot easier than getting the sack off for, for a, a standard inguinal undescended testis. But it doesn't matter so much where you do it. Uh, PJ asked uh, your recommendation for orchidectomy in UDT. Well, um, I think orchidectomy in UDT. Let me, let me see if I can list some possibilities. Certainly a UDT that looks abnormal, structurally abnormal. I would probably remove in the face of a contralateral. Remember, you have to go back to the days when Frank Himmon would recommend an orchiectomy for a abdominal, any abdominal testis and any boy who has a normal testis on the other side. He said it just wasn't worth putting down. I don't think that's necessarily true, but certainly if the testis looked abnormal uh, in any way. I also, in my lecture, did talk about which ones I would biopsy, and I won't repeat that again, but I would put that as a caveat that some you should biopsy as well. And then I think an, an undescended testis in a postpubital boy in which you cannot comfortably get it down into the scrotum without any tension and has a normal testis on the other side, I would remove that testis uh, as well. Yang, do you have any other thoughts about that? No, I, I agree with what you said, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh <laughs> When do you biopsy the testes in regular orchidopexy? Well, mostly just the postpubital age group or the undescended testes that's associated with a chromosomal abnormality, because those are the ones that certainly have a um, increased risk of uh, having uh, carcinoma in situ. And I have seen it on a couple of occasions 
as well. So mostly the postpubertal population are chromosomal abnormality. Uh, Sorrilla, Jose Sorrilla, what about the use of HCG from re for retracted testicles? Well, if it's truly a retractile testicle and you're very comfortable with that on examination, uh, I would probably not use HCG because 90 plus percent of those will descend on their own. Having said that, I think it's important that the pediatrician not forget about that patient. And I, we, in our practice at Brown, I generally would bring the retractile testis back every year or every couple of years in order to uh, re-examine them ourselves as well because of that incidence of uh, ascent that uh, Yang Wu had just spoken about. I wouldn't rely on the pediatrician, in other words. Uh, your Jose Garrido ask follow up on testicular calcification only with USG, the ultrasound, or markers? Well, I don't know the answer to that, quite honestly. Um, I think that if it's an undescended testis, with microlithiasis, that I see that child in the office every year and I get an ultrasound on them. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I had been getting markers on them as well, but I've never seen a positive marker. So I don't, I haven't done that of late um, or in later in my career, I did not do that. Um, but I think the point to be made is that because of that increased risk in that particular population, I think it's important that that child be followed until they can perform reliable testicular self-examination. I might also put a little note in there that I don't know if you know this, but it was about a year, maybe two ago, that the um, American Academy of Pediatrics uh, came out against uh, testicular self-examination. And they felt it wasn't worth it and that the yield was very, very low. Well, they might be true in the general population. I don't know, that might be the case. But certainly for these higher risk patients, I think the sticker examination is still something that we should be advocating for. Yeah, there are many questions. Do you do we have time, Tony? I, I have some time, yeah. Okay. Uh, just a few quick questions. Following the patient after two stage polar stiffens, do you recommend a biopsy in the testicles? I I, I don't. Um, as I mentioned uh, briefly in the talk, um, for two-stage follow Stevens orchidopexy, I do get an ultrasound at about the six-month visit in order to document the size of the testis and also have a delineation, objective delineation as far as blood flow to the testis is concerned. And once that's the case and things are okay and the testis seems to be down without any tension, I discharge the patient and I don't follow them up, even to the pediatrician for examination. Uh, your opinion about undescended uh, testicles? Ah, you answered that. Do you resect it uh, or not? No microlithiasis? I think that this is all, Tony. We have some questions in YouTube, please give me. Uh, I hope I do the, the right question. Kusulba say, your age when you utilize some quadruband for bilateral orchidopexy? I think that, do you understood? Uh, not quite, tell me, tell me again. Uh, do you have any age when you use some uh, quadruband for orchidopexy, bilateral or orchido orchidopexy? You know, maybe he's talking about hormones. Do you use? Well, I haven't. I haven't yet. I don't think the data is quite at the point where one can advocate that across the board. Um, I would like to see some more data come out regarding um, the not so much the benefit, but whether there's any increased risk in using it. So I don't have an age. But I, I, if you follow the work of Hadlamovic, he would say that um, you use something like GnRH for six months post orchidopexy is what he would recommend. Okay, so people, we are finishing with this because we have an hour and Dr. Caldamone told me that he has a, he has a, he's busy for this time ahead. Tony, thank you very much for your uh, 
beautiful presentation and for your time with us. We do appreciate really all the time we call you, you are with us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. It was wonderful to see so many familiar faces and so many uh, friends here today, some of whom I said hello to, some of whom I haven't had a chance to say hello to as yet. Uh, but I miss all of you, and uh, I do hope that we're able to uh, get together again soon in a, in a safe environment. And thank you, German, for uh, setting this up and all of the uh, details that went into uh, putting this together. Appreciate it very, very much. And I look forward to uh, jumping in on uh, some of these lectures uh, on Tuesday mornings, uh, moving towards the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a todos por su gentil presencia. Les agradecemos eh, la gentileza de estar con nosotros. Y el próximo martes lo tendremos al profesor eh, PJ López de Chile con reflujo vesicuratelar, una historia sobre el reflujo vesicuratelar y algo parecido a eso. Muchas gracias otra vez y hasta el próximo martes. Hasta pronto. Bye, Tony. Gracias. Bye, everyone. Gracias, Thank you very much. Bye, bye. Good to see everyone. Bye, Tony. Take care. Have a good see day. You. Good to see you. Cuídense. Cuídense. Muy lindo, Germán. Muy lindo. Gracias, Pachi. Un abrazo. Muy, muy bien. Es, es, es un verdadero maestro el, el hombre este. ¿da? Las conferencias tan ordenadas, tan bien, tan pausadas, con los puntos críticos. Realmente es... Oh, Tony, you are there. Oh, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm still here. Well, I said that you give us a great talk and that you are a, a real teacher, non pediatric urologist, because you are so clear, so calm, and good information, good topics. Uh, congratulations, and we enjoy very much the real teacher. Uh, Francisco, thank you so much. It's very, very kind of you to say because um, uh, I admire your teaching style as well, as you know, and we also had a uh, some fun together in Patagonia recently. <laughs> good. It's good, to see, you, good to see Nunzio. Nunzio, how are you? Hello, Nunzio. Nunzio, how are you? Good to nice see to you. See. Okay, Pascual, Nunzio. Prazer. Javier, good to see you also. The Ricardo Subieta is also with, with us, Tony. Is he? Oh, uh, Ricardo, how are you? Good to see you. Are you still, Ricardo, are you still in the mountains? Yeah, <laughs> yes. You're still in the mountains, okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's running from coronavirus. Yes, for sure. Successfully, I hope. That's okay. okay, people, Amadeo, thank you very much. Amadeo, is everything okay in Paraguay? Yeah, it's all fire. Good. We, are, we keep safe and uh, with low incidence of the coronavirus, but closed. Excellent. Keep it keep it that way. Yeah, thank you. We will try. Good. Excellent. Good. Well, stay so, safe, everyone, and uh, be good. And uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next few uh, Tuesday mornings. I'll hop on and uh, catch some of the lectures also. Let me tell you that we have 120 people. In our Excellent. Meeting. Wow. Thank you very much. For bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good morning.